evening, everyone. And welcome to the second in our What If series. Uh, my name is Pete Damiano, director of the University of Iowa Public Policy Center. And this What If series we put together as an opportunity to engage the community in a discussion about some plausible hypothetical types of situations. Uh, some of you, I know, were here last week when we were talking about what if gas were ten dollars a gallon in the next two to five years. Tonight, we're going to be talking about what if we have a sustainable economy, and um, this is something that this first time we're trying this around, but we're very excited about the opportunity. And thank you all for coming out for this. Uh, there have been a number of organizations in the community that have helped to co-host this event: uh, the Iowa City Public Library, the Johnson County Livable Communities, the Iowa City um, Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the League of Women Voters, uh, the Iowa City Press Citizen, Hills Bank, and PATV, which is going to be filming it tonight. Uh, we will be, you know, try, again, trying to engage you in a conversation, and we'll be filming some of that. If at the end you decide that you would like to ask a question but don't want to be on film, uh, just let Leslie Gannon back uh, by the door know, and we will try to buzz that out. PATV will at that time, so you're, you're not shown, but we also don't want to use that as a way to discourage discussion. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Professor John Carlson, who is a professor in the College of Law and Public Policy Center, and he's going to be introducing our panel. Okay. You guys want to come on up? is also an assistant professor at the university in the um, Department of Economics in the College of Business. I don't know your specialty, Dave. What, what is it? Uh, so I do a lot of work um, related to health economics and the economics of education. Okay, thank you. And next to Dave is Wendy Ford. Wendy is the economic development coordinator at the uh, City of Iowa City. So we have three economists to talk to us today about um, uh, about sustainability. Now the two professors are assistant professors and the third is in the uh, city. So none of them are really skilled pontificators. <laughs> you, you have to reach the level of full professor to be a skilled pontificator. So they would prefer a discussion and a conversation. They're envisioning this as sitting down around a table and having a conversation about what the implications of sustainability are, good thing to get it, bad thing to get it, is it even possible? And they're each going to say a few words, but they ask me to say, they want to talk to you. So right from the get-go, um, be thinking of what you're going to ask them and jump in whenever, whenever you'd like, and especially because they gave me questions that I have to ask if you don't. So, so we need your um, involvement. So let's kick off. All right, so what we thought we would do was um, just sort of start off with um, some definitions of sustainability, how, we're, how economists and how the, the sort of the general public is thinking about sustainability, and then just throw up some facts, and then go from there and see where the world takes us. Okay, so since coming to the university, of Iowa, I've been keeping a catalog of definitions of sustainability, and so I've collected about 134 so far, um, and counting every day there seems to be another one. So what I've done is I've sort of grouped them into three categories, or three general ideas that we can think about in terms of sustainability. So the first one is along the lines of ensuring that, so sustainability is ensuring that we meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So much more of a discussion about intergenerational equity and caring about moving from one generation to the next. If I think about the next sort of class of, of, of um, definitions, they're really dealing with the, the long-term cultural, economic, and environmental health and vitality. Again, with this emphasis on the long-term. And so if I sort of 
think about it as the sustainability triangle, which is commonly talked about. We can think about sort of these three E's of sustainability, the equity, the economy, and the environment. And that when we get into sort of discussions about economics and the environment, we're really talking about a conflict over resources. When we think about equity versus the economy, we're thinking about property rights and who should have property rights and how are those property rights distributed, how is that allocation distributed. And then when thinking about equity in the environment, we're, we're in some sense talking about environmental justice or social justice and how should resources be distributed across different groups of people. The other way that I was thinking about that we could think about this is something that's the Venn diagram approach to sustainability. And so that we have our three E's in there again, only this one's now in society instead of equity. But then when we're making decisions, we can think about the economic consequences of those decisions, the societal consequences of those decisions, and the environmental consequences of those decisions. And that we could think about those same conflicts or, the, or giving rise to um, better solutions as being the intersection of those. And if we get to this idea of sustainability, we're at the intersection of all three of those spheres of influence. Okay. The third one is much more of how I think about it, because I'm a good economist, and thinking about it in terms of capital stocks, so that we can think about the maintenance of capital stocks where we have this idea of physical, natural, and human capital stocks, and that as I move through the world, I want to maintain this value of capital stocks. So if I think about how a traditional economist would model or think about economic growth, what are we trying to do? We're trying to increase that capital stock so that we have more production. And so that we can, in some sense, think about that we have three different spheres of capital stock, that physical, human, and natural. And we might also tie into that some sort of cultural or social capital. And so sort of further building on that or further thinking about that in a little bit more detail, one of the ways that we can, we can start to think about this idea of a capital stock is if I dig up oil, well, I can't replace that oil, so in some sense I've, I've torn down a little bit of that natural capital. And do I allow either society or this idea of producing something, whether it's just consumer goods or, or satisfaction, do I allow substitution to that um, natural capital depletion to human and physical capital? So thinking much more like um, how Wyoming does their royalties for... Um, for oil and natural gas and coal. When they dig up that oil, natural gas and coal, it goes into a permanent fund and then they just scrape off of the permanent fund. So that we're tying in to some idea of we're gonna replace that natural capital with a lot of other. We can think about further subdividing natural capital into a whole bunch of ecosystem services and do I allow substitution across those ecosystem services? If I tear up a wetland, do I allow that wetland to be replaced with something else? Or in the case of Iowa, do I have to replace it with more wetland? So how substitutable we in some sense feel about these capital stocks. Sort of in the, in the most broad sense, capital is perfectly substitutable across these three ideas. And sort of in the most strictest sense, it's not substitutable at all across these different ecosystem services. Okay, so let's Sort of when I look at all the definitions of sustainability, those are the three broad categories that I sort of see coming out of both the economics, the sociology, the psychology, the ethics, and, and all sorts of, of different disciplines. What I wanted to do now was just to sort of paint a picture for you of the United States at this moment in time and where are we headed, where are we, where are we going. Choose about eight different metrics where data is easily gettable and that we're, we're not going to fight over where the data came from. Okay, so if I think about the sort of the first, the starting point that we've got this economy, let's just think about GDP growth. And so there's the GDP growth since 1929. If I thought that the only thing I cared about was growing my economy, I'd say we're doing pretty well. Okay, if I now break down where is it that that money is going and think about, in some sense, this idea of distribution, what I've plotted up here is the mean distribution for the 20th percentile, the 40th percentile, the 60th. So breaking up the world up into you know, low income, middle income, and high income. And what we sort of see is these lower incomes have in some sense stagnated okay, since the late 60s. That the growth rate for the bottom half of the income distribution is about 0.4% a year. Compare that to the growth rate of the top 5%, which is about 1.4% a year. So we're getting very different growth paths for income 
depending on where you fall within the distribution of income. Okay, so maybe we need to talk about that. If I think about some of these ideas of social problems, what I've done is just picked out incarceration rates by race and by gender. And so if I use the data from 2001, what do we see? We see that roughly one in three black males will be in prison sometime in their life, as compared to about one in 20 or one in 18 white males will be in prison in their lifetime. So that there may some, be some social inequity there in terms of incarceration. And this is just a snapshot, this is just 2001. We see a similar picture in terms of the racial profile for females as well, it's just the numbers are a lot lower for females. If I now think about some idea of how are we doing on pollution, so what I've done is I've taken the emissions of 630 <coughs> different chemicals, weighted them by their toxicity, and weighted them by their vulnerable populations, to, so trying to get at different people are facing different um, pollution, pollutants, as well as different people are more sensitive to them, and plotted that with income. So what do we see? We see as incomes rise within the United States, toxicity or bad emissions are rising as well until we reach a turning point around $40,000 in per capita income and then it comes down. So that we see what's known in the economics literature as the environmental Kuznets curve. We see this rise in pollution and then a falling in pollution. If we now look at that same idea but take a little bit different indicator and this is looking at biodiversity within the United States doing this same mapping between um, income and biodiversity, and this is biodiversity of birds, what do we see? We see a fall in biodiversity, followed by a slight gain, and then a further fall. And so we've got about eight different metrics up there to just sort of start you thinking about where is it that we stand, where is it that we're going, and are we on the right path? Okay, just to, so that we have some starting point for, to carry on the discussion. Is there anything you wanted to say, Dave? You can say no. Well, so, uh, I mean, so, uh, I'm sorry. I think you're on. It's on. It's on. No it's on. kidding. Oh, goodness. <laughs> uh, so, I guess I'll, so I did actually just want to ask you a question. This is per capita income by geography? So this is, um, yeah, so it's by metropolitan statistical area. So this is bird biodiversity because birds are an indicator species for environmental quality and so we see in, in basically a, a downward trend with this little up and that uptick occurs roughly with per capita incomes of the 1970s so that we may see that that uptick is coming from the Clean Water Act or Clean Air Act. Okay yeah I mean I guess the only other thing I would throw out is um, you can look at this um, relationship between emissions and income not just within the US but then also across countries <coughs> and if I recall it correctly, it's basically still going up, but there's questions as to whether or not it's starting to tip down. So it depends on the emissions that you're talking about. So that's, I mean, that's the big thing is what I've tried to do is step away from that microphone. What I've tried to do with that is to look at 630 chemicals that are, I just don't like that feedback. Um, <laughs> so it's to try and look at 630 different chemicals. The big chemicals that we don't hit are carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, NOx, SOx, all the criteria and air pollutants that EPA considers um, in determining whether or not a county is in compliance. And so this is really coming from what's known as the toxic release inventory, if you care. Um, but it's to try and get a broader measure of how are we actually doing rather than just focusing on those. And so if I look at generally within that, that literature on the environmental acoustics curve, we really see that shape holding for pollutants that cause harm. And we don't see that shape holding for things like carbon dioxide where we don't see the harm yet. Does that help? Right. I, I, there's a microphone too, if anybody has a question, they'll bring the mic to you. So please just stand up and raise your hand. I'm still confused about your curves. Are, is this uh, how... Can you explain it again? Is this how, if, I, I just want to know, is this how things have changed over time? This is how things have changed system. over time and space. So we're looking at um, 360 different communities within the United States since um, the mid-80s or so. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to construct an idea of 
as we see incomes rising, whether we see incomes rising through time or whether we see different communities, you know, the difference between San Francisco and Detroit. Well, they're in the same country, but they have very different incomes. And so trying to capture that within this whole idea. So that we're trying to map out how do income, how are incomes affecting biodiversity or a, sort of a general measure of environmental quality. So the greater the income, the less biodiversity. That's what it's saying. Okay. That's sort of this, there's this little uptick right here. But in some sense, you can ignore that. One of the reasons that I wanted to present this, or one of the reasons that economists like to talk about this environmental Kuznets curve is comes out of the um, NAFTA negotiations, in which we were, were worried that if the U.S. And, and Mexico, in some sense, merged into one trade organization, that we would see all the jobs and all the pollution shipped to Mexico. And the way that the economists wanted to counter that was to say, well, Mexico will now grow. And if Mexico grows and that relationship holds, then Mexico will emit less pollution. And sort of that's where this whole literature started, was trying to think about trade in the environment when we're thinking about trade agreements. Yeah? And the one on emissions, maybe I misunderstood. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. I looked at that and I thought, if I'm poor, I have a low income, I'm going to be surrounded by toxic emissions. Well, if I'm wealthy, I'm going to be able to move away from that. But are you saying that? No. So what we're saying okay. is something a little bit different. That if you're poor, there's probably not a lot of manufacturing in your community. And therefore, there's probably not a lot of pollution. And then as you grow, as you develop this manufacturing industry, you pollute. That's the peak. And then as I grow even further, I clean up. This sort of gets into this idea where the story that we want to tell is we move from, you know, hunter-gatherers and agrarian lifestyles to manufacturing to service. And that's the sort of the emissions profile that we should see if that story is right. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll throw something out to all of you, including the economic development coordinator, because it, it matters to you. So if I take your capital, your capital approach to sustainability, um, isn't that a recipe for no environmental protection at all? They just say, use up all the resources, use up all the environment, because you can put it into improving your educational system, growing your human capital. I mean, how, how do you... You want me to take all of that? I yeah, want all cool. of you to take that. <laughs> so if I think about it, we've got different kinds of resources out there. We've got depletable and we've got renewable resources out there. And if I think about the depletable resources, if I pull the depletable resources out of the ground, I can't, in some sense, replace them with the same resource. Because if I pull the oil out of the ground, why do I want to push it back into the ground? Okay, so that gets at that if I'm thinking about oil as an ecosystem service, I don't, in some sense, want to confine myself with oil to pulling it out and pushing it back because I don't get anything out of it. And so if I'm going to pull these depletable resources out of the ground, do I want to how I like to explain it to my students, do I want to go on a drunken binge? Or is it that I want to take that and invest it into something else? Okay, and so if I think about sort of drawing the dichotomy that we have right now with sort of energy development within the United States, if I think about how Wyoming is doing it, Wyoming is taking that money and investing it in a fund, and the interest that they earn on that fund, they use it. And they use it to both lower taxes and to provide $3,000 scholarships to all students going to the University of Wyoming. If I compare that to Montana, what Montana does is they pull that oil out of the ground, oil and natural gas out of the ground, and then the oil company gets a two-year furlough on paying taxes or on paying royalties on it. Okay, so they're two very different. In Wyoming's case, they're in some sense investing in improving their world, improving their world through investments in infrastructure and investments in um, human capital, whereas in Montana it's just a direct subsidy to oil companies or natural gas companies. So we've got two, a bunch of different models for how this is going and as we see this natural gas expansion within the United States we're seeing very different models for how communities are taking it over. And so depending on how I feel about this substitution between these different types of capital, we can get very different outcomes. And if I take 
sort of, you know, the way that I like to explain it is if I take the wetlands in Iowa, if you're a developer and you tear up wetlands, what do you have to do? You have to provide wetlands someplace else so that you're keeping that idea of natural capital within that bin of capital, the wetland capital, constant. The other way that I could think about it is if I tear up some natural capital, I, may, I might not confine myself either as societal preferences or something else into something else. But if I tear up some other natural capital, I may turn it into human capital or other physical capital. And it depends upon the preferences of the society for how we actually want to think about that substitution between those different types of capital. So we're not, in some sense, automatically going down this bad road. But if we think about depletable resources, we may be going automatically down this bad road if I'm taking depletable resources and turning them just into human capital. We don't have to do that with renewable resources. Does that make any sense to anyone? For the city, I think um, one of our depletable resources is the land that we have within our uh, municipal boundaries. And that's one of the reasons why, um, at city staff level anyway, we look at existing neighborhoods that could be redeveloped or enhanced um, as being potentially or perhaps more valuable than the green fields on the edge of town, where it's easier uh, for a developer to come in and, and put a building on a green field than it is, say, in an existing area, either the core of your downtown or a neighborhood that may be falling into disrepair or having uh, experienced some dis uh, disinvestment um, as something very uh, economical because infrastructure is there, schools are there, trails are there, and um, all of the resources that we need to make a neighborhood without adding to the sewer system, the water system, the bus lines, and uh, the school system even um, to build out on the edge of land. So that's why you see the premium in my small uh, microcosm, why you see the premium on these uh, interior areas in our town um, and, and us spending time and resources on ensuring that those are developed uh, as well as they can be. Great. <laughs> Uh, I don't really have much else to, to add to that. Um, I'll open that up if someone else wants to jump in. You said carbon dioxide is not factored into this yet, right? Right. Do you plan on adding that? Because if I'm understanding what James Hansen is saying, Things are going to come to a head rather soon. We're already at 400 parts per million. And I don't know where I came across this. I downloaded this free book, Sustainability Without All the Hot Air, by J.C. McKay. He's from the UK. And basically, I just started it. And if I'm understanding the numbers correctly, if we really want to solve the climate change issue. The UK is going to have to reduce their carbon footprint by 85% by 2050. It's not so much the rate of growth right now in CO2, but the cumulative effects. Basically, the you know what's going to hit the fan rather quickly. So, my question for you is, when do we, okay, the you were bringing up human capital, the finance, you know, the money capital, and natural capital. Mm -hmm. I think you could, in my humble opinion, and you know, I, this isn't based on any numbers, I think you can only go so far on the drawdown of natural capital. I would hate to inherit a planet where there is no species diversity. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't want to see the planet just filled with human beings. That's not a world that I would like to live in. So my question for you is, do you, do you plan on adding the, the impact of CO2, methane, so on and so forth? So if, I, if I <laughs> so if I take this, this bird biodiversity, what I'm trying to make the argument by using bird biodiversity is that I'm going to try to incorporate not only everything that I had in the first graph, all those 630 chemicals, but I'm also going to incorporate water pollution, and I'm also going to incorporate land pollution, and land change, and climate change, and all what, by using bird biodiversity, 
since birds are in some sense the first things to be affected, that this is a proxy for trying to look at all of environmental quality. And so that there's the focus within economics has very, tradi very much traditionally been on emissions. And so we get these curves for whatever, we can make one of these curves for whatever pollutant you care about. What I'm more interested in saying is, does there exist a measure of environmental quality that captures everything? And that's what I'm trying to do right there, which says we're going to hit the fan. Okay. That, I mean, that, that's really what I'm trying to make the argument here, is that we actually are in, a, in, a, in some sense a very dire situation. If I take this graph, and I didn't put it up here because I thought it would be too cumbersome, and break it apart according to the eastern and the western United States, the western United States isn't doing so bad. And the reason the western United States isn't doing so bad is because they've got tons of undeveloped land, there's all the public land. If I think about the east, what do we have? Agriculture and towns, and that's it. That there isn't this capacity to absorb all of those pollutants that are going on. We've got significant land use change. The world's a really crazy place. And this curve isn't a nice curve like that. It's just a straight line down. So that, yeah, I am trying to take in, that into account. Um, but it's, I, I would say it's my own personal opinion. It's not good to go pollutant by pollutant by pollutant. That we want to develop some aggregate measure of what do we mean by environmental quality so that we can actually start to say, are we improving the world or are we making the world a worse place from an environmental perspective? And from this, we're making the world a worse place. If that helps. Yeah. And, and I'll just throw out a couple thoughts as well. Uh, it's not clear that, that it necessarily, to the extent to which the UK decreases emissions, um, I, I think it's also useful to keep in mind that they're one small country. Right, I was just using that as an example. Sure. He's got, he basically, if you look at the, this is a, an old report, I think it was published in 2006 or seven. Globally, if you look at pollutants, the carbon dioxide equivalents, on a per person basis at current world population, it was like five tons. You equate that to, then you look at it regionally, and then you look at it by country. And the UK is very close to the US because they had an industrial revolution before we did. And so, yeah, that, that he was just, he's a UK writer, so he was using his own country as an sure. example. Sorry. Yeah, no. Sounds good. <laughs> but I think what that does is it also highlights, right, so you can think about a couple things. Right? So you can think about um, what is the problem and then what could potential solutions be. And I think one of the things that that highlights is when it's a cross-country uh, solution that's necessary, then that just uh, basically expands the difficulties for policy options. And I think that's a lot of, of part of the difficulty that we'll end up facing. Is, so, is that it's not just a country-specific solution. Just to, just to dovetail off what Dave is talking about. So if I, if, if, when I think about developing environmental policy, the environmental policy should, at a jurisdictional level, correlate to where are the damages that are occurring from whatever that pollutant or environmental change is. And so if I go to climate change, now I need a global jurisdiction, which we don't have. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes an incredibly difficult problem because we don't have that jurisdiction. If I think about pollution in the United States, where the damages occur in the United States, <laughs> then we can start to talk about how does the federal government, if we're thinking about pollution that occurs in Iowa City and all the damages occur in Iowa City, then we should look for an Iowa City solution. And so that the scale of the problem should be the scale of the solution. And the problem becomes when they cross jurisdictional boundaries. So thinking about East Coast pollution going over to the <coughs> UK. Now, how do I start to regulate East Coast pollution when all the damages are occurring in the UK? And so the, 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 the policy problems become huge the minute we start to cross jurisdictional boundaries. Okay. Sorry, I've just been reading Hanson lately a lot. He's for a carbon tax. You get it, you, you, when it comes out of the mine, comes out of the pipeline, or when, if you're importing, you apply a carbon tax. And, and then everyone would get a dividend on this. And that could be implemented globally. I mean, we would start out as an example, 
and sooner or later he thinks it would go globally. And also, and, and if you do not have a car, and you're if you do not have a carbon tax, but you're importing something from that country, then you put a tariff on it. Right. And it just it sounds so simple compared to cap and trade, and it would encourage people to become more efficient. <coughs> So let's, we'll just, we'll, we'll go down that path, because that's the path we're going. Help me. Okay, so if I think about two main economic, um, sort of economic instruments for dealing with environmental problems, the two that you've just mentioned are taxes, so emission taxes, or carbon embodiment, or whatever, some form of tax on pollution, or a cap and trade system. The nice thing about economics is, I don't care which one I do, I'll get the same result. Okay, and it now becomes a discussion about who do we want to bear the burden? Okay, if I go to a tax system, what happens now, people that emit pollution, let's just say that they're emitters, now those people are burdened with that tax. You get a dividend though. No, the, the, the firms are burdened with the tax. Okay. And that, that may be passed on to the consumers, a little bit or all, and now the other piece to that is now what happens with that money? If that money then gets recycled back to individuals as either a dividend or a reduction in income taxes, now we can what what we tend to call it as a double dividend. That you get the dividend of the correction of that environmental problem, plus we get reductions in income taxes. Okay, so the tax would be in some sense good in that way. If I think about a cap and trade system. Now I have to worry about how are those permits for pollution actually allocated. If I think about the U.S.'s situation, what we did with the sulfur dioxide trading program was we gave them to past polluters. So if you polluted before, you were giving these permits. And then you could go to the open market and trade them. We don't have to go that way. We could auction them off. We could give them all to me, and then I could sell them. It doesn't matter how I allocate it. We'll still get the same amount of pollution. But it matters who gets that money. And so if I give them away, what do I, in some sense, buy for my policy? I buy that I'm not going to have the oil companies or the coal companies trying to stomp on that legislation as much. Because they're, in some sense, now given a gift of these permits <laughs> instead of having to pay a tax in order to pollute. So there's very important equity considerations in terms of which of these instruments do I actually use when trying to develop climate policy. And then you overlay another huge caveat to, to that. We don't know what the damages are going to be, and we don't know what the cost to abate pollution is going to be. And so by choosing a tax system, what do we, in some sense, ensure ourselves? We ensure ourselves of what are the economic consequences going to be, because we know what it costs. If I go to a permit system, I now know how much emissions are going to come out, so I've got now certainty on the environmental outcome. And so, how I choose an instrument is very dependent upon not what the ultimate outcome is going to be, but who bears the burden and what are the <coughs> equity considerations and what are my ethics involved in, do I believe that you have the right to a pollute? In some sense, who owns the property rights to clean air? If I think about a tax system, what are we doing? We're saying society owns the property rights and now we're transferring those to the firms to pollute. And that's what in some sense both of those are doing. We're, we're taking the property rights to society instead of just giving them to the firm the right to pollute however much they want. So there's a, there's a lot of political and ethical and sort of economic outcomes that come about in terms of how do I actually choose which instrument is appropriate. Does that help out a little bit or yeah, make I it more confusing? Yeah, I a little <coughs> but, I mean, it's, it's just, That's why it's an incredibly complicated when yeah. we start thinking about environmental using economic instruments to control environmental problems is that there's a, a whole bunch of things that I need to think about. And it's not just getting the right amount of pollution. I'm, I'm thinking about corruption in politics, and I'm thinking about, um, about the... Shall I be louder? <coughs> no, Fred, I need a Fred up oh, here. Okay, um, <laughs> what I'm thinking about is how arbitrary are the allowable levels that we're allowing pollution to happen and the prices that are being charged, the taxation or the cap and trade amounts, 
how arbitrary are they and how influenced are they by the same economic powers to say you've got to give it to us for pennies on the dollar as I mean if we're serious about sustainability we say you pay a dollar on the dollar how close are we I mean do we even know is it are we at currently at a shot shot in the dark we have very little economic instruments for controlling environmental pollution I mean in the grand scheme of things it's mostly done by regulation telling you how much you can emit. I think what I'm, what I'm asking is, what, how do we know, what's we our metric? Do we even have a way of measuring, not so much enforcement, which I think is what you were answering, but in terms of measuring, so if I look gosh, at, if, if this is exponential. So if I look at the Clean Air Act and sort of the benefits estimation versus the cost of implementation, of both the Clean Air Act and the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990, it's about 10 times, or 10 to 100 times the benefits over costs. Does that make, does that Can I, can, can yeah. I jump in? I, the, yeah. the EPA has a very elaborate mechanism for assessing the costs associated with different pollutants and the benefits of reducing those pollutants and the cost to industry. And it goes through an elaborate assessment process every so many years with you know, two, three hundred page reports that are indecipherable to me, but you might be able to understand them if you have a science background. So there is an elaborate process. How influenced that is by political interests who want to downplay the costs or not, I, I, I suppose there is some influence because everybody has the right to comment on what the EPA is doing and criticize. There is a process that's designed to be technocratic rather than politically <coughs> driven um, to answer the questions I think you're getting at. Okay, thank you. And I might add too that the city of Iowa City is um, intent on finding a way to at least benchmark the uh, our own standing here and uh, a couple of years ago hired Brenda Nations who is our sustainability coordinator and she's wonderful and has uh, produced a report that gives us those benchmarks and I don't know if they're tied exactly to the the EPA no that's a that's a different thing that's, okay. we've got our eye on sustainability in Iowa City It seems to me there's a lot of conflict in our current society. Uh, you know, if, if we want to pass down to future generations the same abundance we have, we shouldn't be converting farmland to cities because that's the only source of food we're going to have is you know, the land. And we shouldn't be uh, doing a lot of things uh, by making it less expensive for people to consume stuff because that Says, says that we're going to make more stuff and that more stuff is going to be available to future generations who will be places to dump the stuff that they don't use. And, and so we have to sort of change our whole method. And what we have done in the past does not prepare us for the future, is my fear, is that we have to really revise our thinking drastically in terms of what we consume, how much we leave on the table at the restaurant when we order a nice meal, uh, you know, how much we drive uh, at 20 cents a mile or 40 cents a mile to save 10 cents on a gallon of gas. You know, it's, we have to know, we have to get precise about how much does it cost us to drive, to work, to school, to whatever, we have to get more information about every detail in our lives. And we, we've spent our time taking a relaxed attitude. If we have the money, we can spend it on what we choose to spend it on. We can buy a gas-guzzling SUV, or we can buy a Prius, or we can, you know, we can do that because supposedly we have the money. But all of these things have costs that are not obvious, and we have to get attuned to that everything has a cost associated with it. Even the things that save us energy and money have costs associated with it. The Prius probably costs just as much to build as, as an SUV in terms of you know, green energy. Is that 
acceptable? Do we need mass transit instead of individual vehicles? Do we need to have bicycles instead of, you know, what? There's a big list of things that we have to look at, and we don't, we seem to be starting at the wrong end. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I'll just kind of jump in with a question response, right? So, I mean, I, I think you're posing lots of interesting questions in terms of how to think through, you know, what are the costs of the choices that we make. So, I'm just going to stand up, so I can't see anything. Good. Yes. Uh, Thank you. Much easier. All right, so I think there's lots of interesting questions to throw out in terms of what are the costs of the choices we make. There's also interesting questions to think about in terms of how, if we knew, how would we actually respond to costs far in the future versus costs that we face immediately. And, but I want to ask, respond to you with a question. So you ended in, by saying we might be starting at the wrong end or something like that. Um, so I guess I was curious in, in terms of just your thoughts on what alternative do you think might be kind of more useful? Um, my guess is that we have to start training people from the time they can control these concepts in their minds, and that could be five years old or 15 or 27, I don't know what it is. But we have to make them aware that if you're consuming food, there's a cost associated with whatever that food is. If you're eating more, if, if a person of 10 needs 2,000 calories a day, maybe we should just start there and say, you know, you need this many calories a day. If you eat more than that many calories, you're, you're a resource sink. And, and that's not a good thing. So we want you to get to thinking of being just, you know, a resource for some benefit to someone else. You know, so whatever you consume, hopefully there will be some benefit either down the road or maybe immediately that to what you're consuming. But if, and we have too much readily available bad food, which is too easily consumed. Okay, and that's just one area that we sort of need to start working on. And so we have to start training people. And we, you know, I don't you know, if reading and writing and arithmetic are good mental skills, but they're only a start on the way we need to think about how we interact with ourselves and the planet. And so we need to sort of amp up our education in terms of where people emphasize what you need to know in order to be a successful human on the planet, especially two generations down the road as opposed to you know, next week. Okay. Well, I, mean, I think you bring up great questions about kind of the trade-off between now and the future and also the role of education and information, but I'm actually going to Hunt on that and let the woman in front of you respond. What I heard you say, what I hear, we live in such a disposable society, and every time you buy a new phone, every year, you know, that phone might last a little bit longer. We're throwing things, resources, into the landfill. So we have the disposal, the use of the resources, and yet if we don't continue to buy things, then that drives the economy down. At least that's the other thing that I hear. That's the balance that I worry about from our environment, our utilization, having to have the best thing, even though it may not be better, and making things that don't last. Where does that balance come? So I think that's a, an important question, right? So we, I mean, we can think about kind of how um, the influence of our actions on the environment, but then we also want to think about the influence on our, of our actions on the ability of uh, Right, so we can, re we can reduce uh, consumption um, by making everything much more expensive, right? So for people who, I mean, that's basically what a tax does, or, you know, or, uh, um, you know. So, I mean, that could be one potential. But, I, you know, I think it's kind of useful as well to think about um, how that influences people in different spectrums of the income distribution. Right? And I think that's part of the issue that comes up is 
is um, um, a potential trade-off there, um, and how society is willing to make those trade-offs. So one of the things that, that we've been um, talking about some, and that you know I think is kind of a useful um, segue and a question to throw out is is how society trades off um, the uh, role of a focus on jobs and the focus on the environment, right? So if you want to think about um, the situation that we've been facing in the last few years, uh, we're with very high unemployment rate that's now falling. Um, how do we, uh, or is there a potential trade-off between trying to prioritize a, a focus on jobs and whether or not that has a, a negative influence on the environment down the road. Um, and that, I'll throw it out and I have other questions on there. Well, I think that's a really, uh, probably the, one of my key questions. I come in and uh, if we're not from the, the academy, maybe many of us came in thinking about uh, sustainability as relating to the depletion of things that we need, like there's oil, but there's water, which is even more basic and also the contamination of, of our environment that might make it uh, difficult for us to carry on with what we've got here in our civilization. But what you bring up between uh, you know, jobs and the environment, I think, is one of the key questions. I notice on all of your curves, you've really plotted everything against per capita income. And that's because, I guess, you can measure that. Yep. It's a filter, and you can measure that. When it comes to the environment, there's so much that we can't measure. We'd have to assign a value to wetlands. We'd have to assign a value to clean air. And we're not anywhere near that. So, I, mean, I, yeah. so I, would, I would say you're right. And so what we've in some sense been trying to do within environmental economics, at least for the last 40 years or so, is to try and get at least a good guess so that we have something to go to the table with. Okay, and so if I start to think about how policies are designed and benefit cost analysis, that we've got an executive order out there that says we have to do benefit cost analysis for projects that are more than $100 million worth of impact, well now we need to put that, that in some sense dollar value out there so that we find out whether or not benefits outweigh costs. So that's in some sense one starting point from that. If I then further look at policy, we've got these economic impact assessments, but we've also got the environmental impact assessment. And I don't think you can think about one without the other. And so that we need a number to bring it to the table. And we need values to bring to the table so that we at least get into the discussion. The other thing that I, I would sort of think about is, I'm going to just say I'm an economist, and I'm going to say, we do bad things, not as economists, but as people. And so what is it that all these taxes, all these permits, trying to correct all these bad things about markets, what are we trying to do? We're trying to agree on policy, so we're mutually agreeing that we do bad things. So the way that I like to explain it is mutually agreed upon mutual coercion. If I could get that value right, and we can agree on what that value is as a society, then you will make the same choices that society wants you to make. And that the reason that we don't make the, the choices that society wants to, us to make is because we don't have to respond to the incentives. That we're facing a different set of incentives than is society. And one way to think about sort of the role of environmental economics is to try and correct where you're making bad choices. Where you're not making bad choices for yourself, but you're making bad choices for society. If we agree upon what are bad choices and what are the costs of your choices, now we're going to make you pay those costs. I would suggest that there are some very powerful interests that don't want us to assign that kind of value and to have to make that kind of choice. And I would say that there are some people like me on the other side that are trying very, very hard to get those discussions going. More power to you. And you know, you know everybody makes or pokes fun at economists, you know, we're all out to change the world too. We're all out to make the world a better place. And it's just we have, you know, some people believe that opening up to trade is making the world a better place because it raises incomes. If that's your measure of well-being, then you're doing a good job. 
If, on the other hand, we start to make a bigger definition for what well-being is, and that's in some sense what we're trying to do through this idea of sustainability, is to say there exists more than just the economy, there exists more than just the financial resources, that we need to move in a direction which is better for society. And I'm a bad person because I make bad decisions. And now, if I pay those consequences, I'll learn from my mistakes, and I'll move on and be a better person if we can agree on what's best for society. And I think that's in some sense where we're at in this world is we don't agree as a society what's best for society. Well, someone mentioned corruption a while ago. And I, uh, I, I think a lot of people, I agree, believe that um, uh, our political system is responding to interests that if, it, if you're an oil company, you don't want atmospheric carbon to have a value. If you are uh, 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 an agribusiness conglomerate, you don't want the fishing in Louisiana to be able to recover the cost of the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico from you. Right? So the corruption comes in the... Uh, those interests standing in the way of the work that, that I, I gather you're trying to do and to put forward as a policy. But I don't want that to happen either, right? So I don't want to have to pay the fishermen because in my retirement fund, I've got stocks that are going up like crazy and I want to retire on those. So it's nice to talk about it. But I like what's in my retirement fund. So if you all want your retirement funds to go back down, that's great. But then don't complain when you can't buy the house in Florida that you want to live in, or you can't walk down the trail that can't get built because you didn't want to have to pay the taxes because you ain't got no retirement. I mean, the sustainability is great. We're all, that this liberal view is great. But where's the idea that we're all living off that money? Hello. 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 Let's get a couple of questions from people we haven't heard from yet. Okay. I'm sorry. I wanted to say that's my understanding that if we were really to pursue green energy and green jobs in this country, it wouldn't be a question of jobs or the environment. Yes. That there's plenty of development that's possible in uh, sustainable, renewable energy. The other thing is that, that you know, it's a really a, a great um, question about what kind of a society we've created that there are twice as many people in prison as there are in agriculture. You know, what, what, what are we, what kind of values do we have? That's, that's my question. We've been told that we have to have more to be happy, and yet the happiness studies that have been done show that there's a certain amount that we need to take care of basic needs. Beyond that, we don't need much more to be happy. And, and so we've been sold a bill of goods at, as a society. We need to really wake up, become more conscious about who's trying to sell us what idea or what product so that we can take back our ability to, um, to make decisions that really matter. Is the house in Florida? I don't want to fight with you, but this is just a great example. It's more fun to fight about it than oh, I, I, talk. I really don't want to do that. But you know, are That's some of these things part. really necessary? Are are they are they important? That so important that we have to have economic injustice and environmental injustice. Um, we we are all in this together, and eventually the house in Florida is going to go under. Um, and the and the trail is going to go, um, you know, it's, it's not going to be maintained. We 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 need to make the trails. We need to maintain them. We are the people of the world, and we're a higher developed consciousness than our animal and plant brothers and sisters are. But we need to take care of them too if we want to continue to be here. So there are big questions that haven't been asked for some time now, maybe a hundred years. And if we can kind of go back to figuring out how we live with the land and its population, then I think there's some hope for us. But if we all play our own little greed card, I, I, I really worry about our, our future as a species. 
That's not a question, is it? <laughs> I would just like to say I love what you just said. I've been sitting here thinking um, what matters most and this research about what matters most to us. I'd like to see some charts. Once we meet our basic needs, what would the environment look like? If we just were meeting our basic needs and we had an abundance of art and music and relationships and community, um, a post-consumer society that focuses on um, generational equity. So, so I'm going to just throw out something. That all seems nice. Um, so I mean, I guess the question is, Right, so when, when you describe it, it seems great, and then you wonder, why don't we have that? Right, I mean, everybody would think that sounds great. So what are the um, challenges? Sorry? Advertising, Advertising and media is one challenge. Okay. It's the fact that ExxonMobil has, has control over so much of the media. Getting back to your point, you got a very good point. I suggest that everyone go to the Rocky Mount Institute website, Amory Lovins. I remember him. I, I, I remember meeting him. I was an energy planner for 14 years. He's written a brand new book about the potential for renewables and energy efficiency. You, there is going to be a huge debate between James, the James Hansons, and I love this man. He went to the University of Iowa. He's a climate change expert. He thinks we need nuclear, nuclear fuel to get us out of the mess that we have now created because the clock is ticking so fast in climate change. Amy Levin says, no, we can do it through renewables. You want to invest? Invest in renewables. That's, that's the future, at least according to Amy Levin. So we've taken care of investments for the long term. You get every house energy efficient, every business energy efficient, and you start pushing out renewables, fine. You will make your income for your, for your retirement, and we will all improve. On the other hand, you were talking, both of you were talking about, you know, can we, re when's enough enough? Charity Nebby on, uh, Nebby on Talk of Iowa the other day had a, a woman on, she, they were talking about how environmentalism has now gotten into the churches. This woman lives frugally. She came across a website that would anticipate that if everyone would live like she did, how many planets would we need? Now here is a frugal woman. If everyone lived like she did, five planets. No one, the numbers are huge on this. We've got huge things to overcome. And we need to start acting now. ExxonMobil, the, the, the fuel companies do not need the subsidies, and what's happening, they're taking over control of the media, and, you know, the renewables do not have subsidies, or they're low in comparison to the, to the fossil fuels, and people just do not understand the potential that their home has in terms of reducing their energy use. Also, I think we need to redefine freedom. Everyone wants their freedom in this country. 150 years ago, if you wanted to go out in your backyard and kill 50 chickens, fine and dandy, no big deal. No one was looking at you. We don't live in huge rural areas anymore. We all live in apartment buildings. That's sort of a metaphor. We're all crowded. And when you, when you start living in more crowded environments, your freedom has got to be reduced. But yet we still act as though the world is still the great wild west. The United States has all this land to conquer. We've got to start changing our attitude about what personal freedom is. Because if we all want our personal freedoms to go out and do any damn thing that we want to do, we're all going to lose. This is what happens when you're retired. You have nothing else to do. <laughs> and then you get crazy. And I live by myself and my dog starts listening. So I'll shut up now. No. Sorry. Uh, Wendy. I would like to hear a little bit more about what, what does Iowa City do, actually, the government of Iowa City for sustainability? You, you started talking about that. Yeah, well, um, I, I really do wish Brenda were here to address some of those things. What uh, I think, but it, start, it has started at the top with the city manager uh, and the city council having put together um, a strategic plan that includes 
an overarching theme of sustainability and inclusivity so that everything that uh, staff recommends to council and the council actually considers action on has at least a sustainability and an inclusivity consideration in it. But beyond that, um, uh, the five goals that the, the council adopted or, or revised just in January, um, those include having healthy neighborhoods. And that includes having trails and making it uh, easy for people to get from work to play to uh, do the living and working that they need to do without having to spend so much on our energy that is, is so finite. To have a strong urban core so that we can get people living and working in downtown. Um, and, and some people in the community say downtown gets so much attention, uh, much to the uh, neglect of the other neighborhoods in town, but this is uh, the, the focal point of our community. It is what people see when they consider where are they going to live and work and play. It is kind of the uh, inner workings. It's the shiny part of Iowa City, in this case, um, that attracts people here. And we need people to fill these jobs, despite the fact that um, uh, unemployment has been high everywhere else. We continually hear out in the economic development world that there aren't enough workers to do uh, the jobs that companies would like to bring here. So we're constantly, we constantly have a dearth of people to, to work in our community. So maintaining that urban core, making it look attractive, and attracting people is very important. And that's one of the uh, strategic goals of the council. Another is engaging in strategic economic development activities and, and um, going, uh, doing more with less and partnering with um, the Chamber, with the Iowa City Area Development Group, with the University of Iowa, trying to grow from within. Um, there's a, a term called economic gardening, which I first thought was a little bit foreign, but I, I like the sound of it. But really what it does is um, grow the potential small firms that we have um, just in nascent form here in uh, here locally. So without going out and quote unquote chasing smokestacks, we want to talk to some of the smart people that are in town um, and have ideas for businesses that with only just a little bit of help could stay here. So being really strategic about the business, business that we grow in Iowa City is um, one of the goals of the of the city council. Obviously, having a solid foundation, solid financial foundation, is important to the council, um, and and watching our dollars as a finite resource as well, which is good. Uh, and then finally, enhanced communication and marketing, which just goes to that making uh, uh, the the great stuff about Iowa City known beyond our beyond our borders and within as well. So I w I would say that it starts with an with an overarching goal, with a plan, uh, mission, vision, and values, and, and those of us on the ground working the plan and, and making suggestions or recommendations to the council who will be voting up or down on these things, use that as a guide to how we spend our very valuable resources of, of time and dollars as well, your valuable resources. I'm not an economist, and I'm not a particularly good capitalist, but it seems that um, Economic success is defined by um, how much growth, how much profit, and that if there's no money in it, it's not worth doing. And a lot of, I think, a lot of the reason we've been so reluctant to look at, at renewable energy is because it's going to take investment first, whereas we have the infrastructure in, a lot of it, and they're still trying to put more in for the oil and gas industries, but we're having to, re we're having to build a new industry and and they're not sure how it's going to be received and how successful it will be, and they don't want to take that risk, and they're not considering the risk of what happens if they don't do anything, which we're already seeing evidence of. And we do need a, a real shift in our thinking of, of what is enough and what do we need, and if we, if we want to globally make a difference in, in both the economy and the climate, we have to be willing to take measures that we would want the other countries to do. And we have countries now like India and China that are, that are gearing up manufacturing and they are, they are polluting more and more people are driving cars because they want to live like we do. And, and we can't expect them to not do that if we can't cut back. And we just, we define our success by how much we grow. And if there's a profit and if growth is flat and stagnant, we think we're doing something wrong. 
But if you keep growing and growing and growing, you're going, you're going to run out. You can only have so much stuff. It becomes a pathology if you have to keep getting more and more and more, whether it's money or things or... I don't know where I'm going with this, but it, it's just... <laughs> if, if we don't do anything or if we're waiting to see what the costs are in, instead of just doing what we know needs to be done, you know, we're all going to lose. Um, and, and, yeah, I don't know where I'm going. When I was 12, I signed up with ZPG, and I didn't have any kids, so, you know, whatever happens in the world, my kids aren't affected. But I'm, I'm worried about the rest of you, you know? And, and I, I do follow the, the reports on climate change and all the extreme weather events that I know are related. And we can talk about a, a sustainable economy, but it's not sustainable if coastal and island nations are disappearing if our water is polluted by, by extraction of oil and natural gas, I mean, you can, you know, what's the price? We don't want to pay too much for gas and oil, but when we have to buy our water, and you have to have the water purified and processed and packaged and sold back to you, you know, that's the cost I don't even want to think about. But when it gets to that point, it's going to be too late. And so we can talk about the, the economy all we want, but that's not the real problem. It's, it's how we look at things and what we need. Well, what's going on right now is that uh, Detroit is being deconstructed. They're, they're knocking down houses. Uh, I assume that's because of taxes more than anything else. But uh, that's pretty much proof by demonstration that it's not sustainable. So can you guys predict, will that happen to other cities? Yes. <laughs> so I think I mean this is I think about this a lot since I'm an economist who teaches in urban and regional planning. We just got done doing a bunch of projects in Cedar Rapids where they're having some of these same difficulties of keeping young people. And so I think of it as sort of a the process of development occurs. And why is it that Cedar Rapids is having trouble keeping this key age bracket of 25 to 40? Is they were relying on the small town kids to come. And now the kids that are in Cedar Rapids, that grew up in Cedar Rapids, go away to Chicago. And that there's this, in some sense, cycle of going to bigger and bigger places. If we can get a reversal, then we can stop cities from dying. But in some sense, this idea of, as we grow and grow and grow, as we move from a manufacturing to a service sector, where would I want to locate myself? Okay? If I think about Detroit is dying because their manufacturing is dying, well, let's move our economy from a manufacturing economy to a service economy. Now I'm no longer dependent upon where I work. Okay? That if I think about why is Detroit there, Detroit is there because of access to resources and the transportation network and everything is there. If I know no longer am tied to markets where I can sell my goods and I'm no longer tied to resources that go into my production, why would I choose to live in Detroit when I could live in Portland or San Francisco or someplace that I actually might want to have some of these amenities. And so I think we're, we're in some sense at a really big cusp. Do we gut the Midwest? And what we're seeing is huge migration patterns to the West and to the South. Do we gut the Midwest and we have some of these cities either die or get much smaller like Detroit is doing? Or do we try and save them? Do we try and save them by offering cheaper housing than you can have? What is the sort of the dynamics that are going to go on over the next 30 to 50 years as we further and further switch our economy to not being place-based, but to being sort of fluid across space? What does that mean? I mean, that's to me one of the big questions that we as a country need to face and we as an economy need to face is what do we do with all this infrastructure and stuff that we have where people are moving away from? So is this dependent in any way on climate change, or is it a totally separate process? No, I mean, it's, it's totally separate that, you know, by some estimates, maybe you really want to be in Minnesota for agriculture in 30 years, or maybe you want to be in Manitoba. But, you know, if I think about, there's, there's really three life decisions that matter, and that, that are, are, in some sense, dealing with space. Where do you live? Where do you work? And what is the trade-off that you're willing to make between where you live and where you work and what are the amenities associated with those, those, that, in some sense, choice of where to live? 
And it truly gets to where do you want to live, and what are the amenities that drive you to want to want to live there. And so I was just in spoke or I was just in Bozeman last week, and what are they worried about? They're worried about a huge influx of population destroying Yellowstone. Okay, and so then what are the you know what are the mechanisms by which we tell people you can't? I mean, they wanted to say nobody can move to Bozeman because we want to keep it how it is. You know, what are the mechanisms that we go at? to try and discourage people from moving to places where we may have excess people. I'm thinking about Phoenix. There's a, you know, there's a resource constraint in Phoenix of water. Should we tell people to stop moving to Phoenix? How can you tell people to stop moving to Phoenix? You know, I mean, there's, there's the, we want to tell people to stop moving to Phoenix because there's no water, but how do we decide? I mean, and that's to me, one of the big things that we, you know, that we want to have this discussion all about is, what are we willing, what sacrifices are we as a society willing to make? And what, in some sense, rights are we willing to forego in order to get to where our society wants to go? But we have to agree where we want to go first. And I don't think we can agree where we want to go. And maybe we just say we don't even, we can't agree, but we're going to, I'm going to be the benevolent dictator and tell you where you're going to go. Sure. Oh, wait, sorry. You, you, had, you had your hand up for a while. I was just, I was hoping to hear all three of you talk about the fact I've noticed that there are a lot of um, wiser individuals in this room. <laughs> and at a certain time in a certain generation, um, maybe like our generation now, we're thinking about building something for ourselves. And, you know, I'd like to think I still am a future generation. That might not be true. I do care about the future as well as well though so I'd like to hear you guys talk about what you want in terms of su sustainability what you're prescribing and what it's going to cost me and then more than me there's other people in other parts of the world who are further behind what I have and they want a piece of it too what's it going to cost them okay so one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is this whole notion of when do I get enough when is enough enough and then after I get enough, what do I now do with myself? Okay, after I've got enough stuff, or I've got enough income to purchase enough stuff, and technology's growing and we're, we're producing more and more stuff with less and less need for me, what do I do with all my leisure time now? And I'm, I'm sort of thinking about it in two ways. One, I could sit in front of an Xbox or I could use consumption, I could buy more stuff, and I'm in some sense combining my leisure time with consumption goods. The other way that I can start to think about it is, well, I don't really like sitting in front of the TV, that I like to go canoeing and skiing and doing all these other things, but that's dependent upon a natural resource or an environment still being there. And so there's this really interesting paper that came out in the 60s that says, maybe we actually need to think about where we're going to decide what we need to do today. And so if I believe that we want to have you know, greater leisure time where we can actually interact with the environmental side of the world, then we need to conserve more of our world today because it has so much more value in the future. So that we're not doing enough on the conservation side today because the demand in the future for those environmental goods is going to be so much greater when we don't have to work and we just hit the button like they did in Star Trek and we get whatever we want. We don't actually have to work. But now I need to do something with myself. And what is that doing something? That, you know, some people may want to sit around and play Xbox. Some people may want to go bicycling or skiing or, or hiking. And so I should make those resources available. And if I do it, then my child's probably going to do it, and their child's probably going to do it. So that there's this dependence upon what I can serve today actually influences the direction in which I'm going to go in the future. And so that we need to be doing more if that's the world that we want to see in the future. I, I don't know if I I don't know if this is even in my in my world to be able to respond to so you know I'm just I'm still reacting to what you said about um, we need to agree as a as a society what's responsible when we can't even agree as a county what's responsible yeah. <laughs> you know I mean it's where where do we start trying to make this sea change that we're all talking about. I throw the question back. 
Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, uh, you know, in terms of what am I prescribing, so I think about that in a guarded sense because, so I teach at the university, um, and I, I think of, if I'm prescribing something, I'm not doing a good job of teaching. Uh, now, that's just kind of my own, you know, pedagogy views. Um, so, I, you know, I, I guess I, I think of it as I'm not actually trying to, to sell a specific point. Uh, I think of it as a, uh, um, a you know, uh, a framework in terms of a way of, of broadly thinking about things. I mean, I think we've touched on a lot of the points here, um, that, you know, that, that, that I would agree with. Um, uh, you know, I think it gets, uh, so one, I, I would just say a few things. Um, so so part, of the, part of the difficulty I think that we face is that everyone has lots of, of kind of views or preferences related to kind of how they want to live in the future. Uh, and so, I mean, you can think of it as there was what, uh, you know, the 140 plus definitions of sustainability. Um, but there's also views in terms of kind of how we would all think of what um, the sustainable future might look like. And it might, you know, if, I think if you got down to the specifics for every person, what that future would look like, it would vary. You know, we, we might get a hundred different um, specific details. And I think that's a lot of the difficulty that we're facing is kind of how to, um, how to kind of be careful about imposing um, our will on others, but at the same time um, being considerate of others' preferences and aggregating in them in such a way that um, society functions, basically. So it's a, that's kind of some of the difficulty I'd say. I'm, I'm trying to wrap my octogenarian mind around this great discussion that you had this evening. And I, 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 a couple of words come to mind. I was captivated by what I think Wendy said about what's happening in sustainability in Iowa City. And the word that I think of is modeling. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, Iowa City belongs to something like a league of municipalities or something like that. And I'm sure that modeling of the kinds of things that you're talking about could be very beneficial on a, on a rather wide basis. The other word that comes to mind is, it's an economic term, I think, and I'm far from being an economist, but the word is incentives. <coughs> and uh, you brought up the, the uh, you know, the, uh, idea of uh, people moving out of places like Phoenix to other kinds of places. There are all kinds of incentives that could be available that would cause people, cause those kinds of shifts that would be extremely beneficial from in the long term. Those are the kinds of uh, ideas that I'm going away with. No, and I, I think that's one of, the, one of the big things that sort of an economist like Dave and I would would agree on is if we can agree what the real cost or what the social value is of all of these different resources, then we can provide the incentives so that people respond how we as a society want them to respond. Without, in some sense, interfering in their daily life. That I'm not going to tell you what to do, I'm just going to provide incentives for you to behave how I as a benevolent dictator want you to behave. So you can make all your own choices and you have all your own freedoms, but you actually have to pay the real cost or the social cost of your behavior. If you want to move to Phoenix, water's $20 per thousand gallons. I mean, yeah, we could do that. And that's really, I mean, what could you do to Bozeman? Well, if a lot of people move in, what do we know is going to happen? The price of houses is going to go up. And so that if those markets or modified markets actually create those incentives, and yes, we should get to where we want to go. And that's sort of, you know, the very libertarian view of the world is markets are great because they do all these great things. And I, as an environmental economist, come in and say, markets are horrible because they forget about this, this, and this. If I could fix the market, now I have, you have all your individual choices, and you're responding how society wants you to. I think that's the, I mean, to me, if you want to take nothing else from economics, Incentives matter.
how how is it? Here in the back. We have a few more minutes. Um, you briefly mentioned the experience economy. Um, as economists, you think we're moving towards the experience economy? And what do you think that will do for our society? Do you think that could um, help us as far as climate change, or do you think that would make a big difference? Or I don't know. <laughs> or we could use the other thing that economists say. It depends. <laughs> um, I don't. I don't know. I don't. We still need to make stuff. I mean, that's the, the part of the thing that you know. In me trying to wrestle and trying to grapple with these bigger issues, we still need to consume stuff. We can't get away from consumption. And do I want to, you know, is there a next person down the line to go to, or do I want to bring everybody up? And, you know, I, I don't have an answer. I don't know where we're going. I hope it's a better place. But we always have to make stuff. And how do we make it? Do we want to do it the most efficiently? Do we want everybody to, do we want to see a huge migration from the urban areas to the rural areas so that we have much more labor intensive agriculture? I mean, I don't, I don't have any answers for you. Do we want to go to a capital intensive rural economy? Do we want to go to a labor intensive economy? I don't have any answers for you. I mean, to me, that's another decision that we as a society want to go, you know, in some sense come to. If we go to a capital intensive society, then I don't need to work. And that's, to me, the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> that I don't have to work. That I just get everything met for me because it's just there. I mean, that's, to me, the ideal situation. But then what do I do? And that's, I mean, there's this, to me, this distinction about where do I work, what do I work, and what do I do that I may get more satisfaction from. So I have no answers for you. Um, I have a question about a specific proposal that the, Iowa, the city government Iowa City could potentially consider that kind of intersects with some of the broader and more abstract ideas we've been talking about. So I work with student government and sustainability and this past fall we sent over 100 emails to over 15 different landowners about installing apartment recycling services. So that would require about a $2.50 tax in cents on consumers. Uh, the City of Iowa City has conducted a pilot program that this would be the monthly extra bill that consumers would have to pay in terms of getting apartment recycling services installed. We conducted a survey and said the vast majority of students would accept this tax. So, um, so take apartments downtown as the Exxon Mobil in this example, and I would love to hear your reactions about how this is a tangible thing that the city of Iowa City could do, what are the obstacles to doing it, and what are some of the reactions from the other panelists? Question. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, obstacles to doing it, I suppose, would be mandating that, that apartment owners or property owners would... Which is uh, essentially what a carbon tax would be, right. a mandate on an mm -hmm. extra cost. So. Would put those out, and then I think the um, enforcement or the, the efficacy of the program uh, would be the next thing that would be a challenge. Um, we all know uh, what, what some of those large uh, dumpster things look like after a weekend. I wonder, I even <laughs> wonder if uh, recycling bins would be, you know, half of them would be used effectively, and I agree that I agree this should happen, um, but I wonder what the uh, what the costs, you know, what the real costs are um, for implementing something like that. Because I don't think we get a hundred percent cooperation or use on that. Um, I'm not quite sure how that how that works effectively. Somebody else jump in there. I mean, right. So in general, you know, I, there's a lot of similar types of policies that, that I think of like that. I mean, the one that I had been thinking of throughout um, was the idea, so I would assume we all have, so, so I'm new to the area, I would assume we all have mid-American energy. If I remember right, we can all pay a little extra to have some source of um, a more renewable energy provide that. I mean, we can all pay there, we get to voluntarily choose to pay extra for it. Um, you know, we could also just impose everyone pays more on it. And so there's a lot of different ways we can, we can do that. Um, and the recycling is a smaller level of that, right? So 250 a month is not a substantial amount. 
as these types of um, fees add up, there's just a, um, a different burden that that faces on different households. Um, so the only thing I would say is that there should, um, to just kind of be aware of that, and perhaps that as you know, some of these fees add up, there should be some type of um, way to help lower, lower income households to pay this. Now the 250 a month is, is, might be small enough that the cost of administering some type of redistribution might be too much, but uh, that would be the only thing that I would think of. Maybe time for one more question or comment, and then we're done. Uh, gentleman in the back, I've just been trying to get in. Well, feel free to deny me. This one might actually take a while. We've talked a lot about discussion this evening, and um, one of the things I was wondering about was a capital that kind of interplays with a lot of the other ones that are main interest, you know, human, physical, and financial, um, and that is the capital of nutrition. And so, with regard to short-term and long-term sustainability, what role um, do you guys think GMOs have? And how do we reconcile the normative goal of no GMOs with the normative goal of feeding everyone and ensuring that there's no malnutrition. <laughs> Feel free to deny it. <laughs> you do I know. <laughs> so, huh. So, the camera's on. <laughs> so, this is why it's embarrassing because I should know more of the basic science underlying GMOs than I do. Uh, so I, I study a lot related to obesity and nutrition. It just so happens to be the case that GMOs are not something that I really have read a lot on. My understanding is that there are some um, un, uncertainty as to um, potential long-run effects. Now, there's uncertainty about long-run effects of everything. Um, um, so, it's a good question. So I'll, I'll step in so because you're still one. So, <laughs> this last summer we had the first BT resistant corn borer in Iowa. And so to me, GMOs and a lot of this stuff scares the bejesus out of me because we'll create a super bug and a bug that we won't know how to deal with. And that's to me, in some sense, the scary part about going down that route is we don't know what the potential unintended consequences of going down that road are. But we're still met with that, in some sense, trade-off that we have to feed the world. And so I don't, again, have an answer to you, but I say this is scary to me because of potentially unintended consequences. This is necessary for me, and I can't make that trade-off. Okay, well, let's thank, whoa, let's thank our parents. And let, let me invite any of you who are interested next week, same time, what if everybody had health insurance?